Welcome to Redbeard and the Den of Tools. Howdy ho guys and gals, it's Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear, back again here in the Den of Tools. And today we're here to look over the life and times of a, a great man in the automotive industry, and that is Lee Iacocca. Lee passed away uh, today, July 2nd, uh, 2019. Uh, he was at the grand old age of 94. He's probably one of the top five greats, in all, if not even higher, in all the uh, automotive history in, in America. And so I wanted to take the time to, to honor him with one of our, our brief history videos. So let's get into it. Lee was born in October, or I should say on October 15th in 1924 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. The son of Italian immigrants, his parents worked at, uh, prior, part of my pronunciation here, Yoko's Hot Dogs. Yoko's is a local restaurant run by their family. I think it was run by uh, by uh, his his uncle actually, and uh, his parents worked there. And but Yoko's has actually become a bit of a regional family establishment. One of those you know local restaurants that everyone knows, the kind of semi famous and such. They currently have six locations. It's still running. You can still go there and get a dog or maybe even a burger or something, and it's still run by the Iacocca family. Now, uh, Lee graduated with honors from Allentown High School in 1942 and then Lehigh uh, University in neighboring uh, Bethlehem. Uh, and he had a degree in industrial engineering. He was also a member of Tai Beta Pi. That's an engineering uh, society, an honor society for engineers. Uh, he also won the Wallace Memorial Fellowship and was able to go to Princeton where he took additional classes in politics and plastics because i guess those go together anyway lee started with ford motor company right after that in 1946 and he started off naturally on the engineering and technical track because he was a you know technical kind of guy but he realized that quickly there that his passion was not in the engineering side but in the marketing and sales side uh, I think he really wanted to get over to the marketing design side, but decided that sales was the way to get there. So he went into that full-fledged, you know, whole hog, if you will. And his big break came in 1956 when working as an assistant sales manager at the Philadelphia location, he came up with a campaign called 56 for 56. This was offering loans on 1956 model cars with a 20% down payment and payments of $56 per month for three years. This this was a huge success. It, the, the whole promotion went national, and it really made a name for him. And he was quickly pulled up to the big leagues. You know, <laughs> they give him a call, and they send him up to the home office there in Dearborn, Michigan. And, and Lee really took off from there. In 1960, the, you know, just a short time later, he was promoted to vice president and general manager of the Ford division. Now, that may seem huge, but you got to remember, this is all a Ford motor company. So there's uh, the Ford division. I mean, yeah, it's big, but it's not all of Ford. Uh, in 1965, he became Ford's vice president of the car and truck group. In 1967, executive vice president. In 1970, president. That is in 10 years from getting called up. Uh, I guess it wasn't 10 years. It was within uh, 14 years of getting called up and 10 years of his first promotion. He went all the way from <laughs> Philadelphia to running the whole show. Well, he was president. He wasn't CEO. There was somebody else in there as CEO, but we'll, we'll talk about him in a moment. Anyway, Lee was instrumental in the design of several iconic models of Ford. In fact, if there's any one thing that he is most most known for, really is he's considered the father of the Mustang. If you're a muscle car guy, in fact, if you're a pony car guy, he, he did it. He's the guy who created the whole pony car concept, which is taking big power in a little tiny package. He, he's, he's your man. If you like, even if you don't like the Mustang, if you like any of the cars that came from that, the Camaro or anything else, you owe him a nod of gratitude. He was behind all of that. Not only that, he was also behind, he, Lee had a bit of swagger. He was also behind the Continental Mark III, which is, man, you, you, that, that's a car where, you know, play, players going to be playing, right? Look at that thing. Oh, I lo love that car. And you know what? But he also understood the everyday man. He understood what almost average bears, bears need, you know, especially when we're getting started in life. And he was also the father of the Ford Escort. 
He, he understood pretty much every aspect of the automotive game. Lee was also responsible for bringing back the Mercury brand, launching the Mercury Cougar and the Mercury Marquis, both great cars. Lee's arg- arguably, and I've said this before, I think probably the greatest leader of Ford since Henry Ford himself. But eight short years after being promoted to president of the company, he got the axe. And why? Well, uh, personal disagreements with Henry Ford II, it looks like. Henry Ford II, HF2 as he often called, was the CEO and uh, he butted heads there with, uh, with Lee Iacocca and it did not work out for Lee. Uh, and apparently all of Lee's you know, greatest hits weren't good enough to keep him uh, you know, at the head of the company and he was let go. Now, Henry Ford's greatest hits, now he did do some great things for the company. Uh, he did hire Iacocca and then fire him. He did also uh, take the company public, raising $650 million, half of which he blew on the Edsel. Um, yeah, he, yeah, I think the pretty much Henry Ford's greatest accomplishment was being the, you know, having the name Ford. Anyway, that's enough of the bear bashing on him. Anyway, Lee was immediately courted by Chrysler Corporation. Chrysler was, oh, they, they were in desperate straits, man. And they needed a strong leader with passion and a vision to come in and take the wheel, if you would. And yeah, and Lee Lee was their man. He came in like a wrecking ball, clearing house, and bringing with him many of his former associates from Ford. Uh, but Lee needed some breathing room. Uh, Chrysler was in bad shape, and you know you can't come in no matter how good you are if the ship's ship's already you know more than half underwater. You're pretty much out of luck. So what he did was he did what, you know, desperate times require desperate measures. So he went to the U.S. government, hat in hand, asking for a bailout. Now, they uh, they agreed to give it to him, but they did require that he was going to have to reduce Chrysler's overall operating costs by 20%. Now, that may not seem like that much, 20%. That's a that's a buck in five, guys. That That's a lot of money. you got to really uh, be serious about uh, cutting costs and cutting corners there to drop 20% of your operating costs. That's huge. But Chrysler did emerge from this as a lean and mean car company that's hungry and ready to take on the rest of the world. One of the key things that Lee brought with him to Chrysler was a whole file full of ideas that he had proposed at Ford, but that uh, Henry Ford II uh, (laughs) had vetoed. (laughs) Guy's brilliant, isn't he? Anyway, first among these was the K-Car. The K-Car concept was simple. Essentially, it was to build an 80s version of the Volkswagen Bug for North America. Now, you got to understand what the, what the VW Bug was. It wasn't just a little econo box. The, the Volkswagen Bug was designed as the everyman's car. It was an affordable car for the average family that anybody could buy, put their whole family in, and drive wherever you wanted to at a reasonable cost. Got good gas mileage, whole nine yards. And that's what the K car was but it was done with a North American twist on it. It was a boxy little sedan. You could fit a family of six in, really, really five comfortably, but you could get six people in if you had to. It got decent gas mileage. It didn't break the bank. It, and it looked like you're a respectable little sedan. You could drive this, you know, dad could drive this car to work and people would look at him like, this is a sound, you know, professional guy. And he could take the family out on the weekend. You could do a lot with one of these cars and, as I said, it was affordable, it was approachable to about anyone. And these cars became the base. Basically, they based every other car in their lineup off of this car, which means sharing parts and sharing blueprints, sharing design. Everything went faster because of this. The K car was so successful that even during the double dip recession of the early 80s, Chrysler did so well, they made so much bank that they were able to pay back their loan with interest a full seven years early. But Lee was just getting started. In 1984, he launched the Min-Max concept of what we now call the minivan. Let's face it, there's there's nothing exciting about a minivan. It's about the most boring vehicle you could possibly ever come up with. But at the same time, you just can't argue with the functionality of that thing. You can do all, so, all sorts of stuff with it. You can fit the whole family in it. In fact, you can fit some of the kids' friends in it with you. You can... Uh, you know, take them out. You can move your house with it. You can put a, you know, trans buy a new fridge and transport it home from the store. These things are the Swiss army knife of cars. They really are, or I should say, of vehicles. Fast forward to 1987, K-Cars now control 20% of their segment. The Chrysler minivan has created a whole new segment that seems to have no end in sight. 
and Chrysler is now firmly in the black. I think most people might be tempted to call that a win and just sit back and retire. But uh, that Lee was not that kind of person. He wasn't done yet. In a move that shocked most people in the company and most pundits, about everyone, he pulled uh, $1.6 billion out of their, uh, their proverbial wallet and bought Jeep from AMC. This, this blew everyone away. I mean, this was a company that was nearly dead seven years prior. Now they're spending 1.6 to buy a questionable, uh, you know, company that from a, another questionable company. And I mean, let's let's face it, Jeep had had a, a mixed run. They had their loyal following, but it wasn't that big. And AMC just couldn't seem to do much right with anybody at that time. But Lee Lee saw the future, man. Lee uh, knew where the market was going. He'd seen how Americans had latched on to the larger minivan and how they liked trucks and how well the truck division was doing as well. And he saw the writing on the wall. And that writing said, S-U-V. SUVs. And we all know where that ended up. In fact, Jeep launched their new flagship model, the Jeep Grand Cherokee, in 1983, the same year that Lee retired from Chrysler. It's funny to think that the last thing that Lee did at Chrysler was to be their most profitable, you know, brand or uh, model yet. In fact, uh, many would argue that uh, in today's new uh, Fiat Chrysler, you know, merger thing, that Jeep is what keeps it afloat and where the value is. You, you got to say, this is a guy who just, I mean, hit after hit after hit. He goes from one company to the next. It, it's like he can't stop winning. He can't help himself. But uh, this was a guy who, who knew where he was going, came from humble means. You know, you can't get more humble than that. Tiny immigrants right off the off the boat and goes to running one of the largest corporations in all the United States. Two of them, in fact. Uh, anyway, so, you know, what does a guy like this do for a hobby, you know? Well, during the time he was saving Chrysler, he was also tapped by then-President Ronald Reagan to lead the restoration pro uh, project for the Statue of Liberty. Lee agreed to as a way to honor his immigrant parents, and he raised $350 million, more than double the original goal, and finished the project in 1986. As I said, Lee died on July 2nd, 2019, in his home in Bel Air at the ripe old age of 94. And I just want to say goodbye, farewell, God bless, and safe passage to Lee, because you brought many of the cars that I love, and I know many of you love, and even if you, you don't like the cars that he created, he created segments. He, he created whole markets that changed the entire American, in fact, world automotive market. And you got you to gotta take a moment and say thank you to a guy like that. Anyway, that's all the bear has for you today. That's our brief history for Lee Iacocca and his automotive you know, history. He did a lot more. He, he, uh, he, he had a lot of uh, uh, you know, other uh, nonprofits and charities that he, he supported and stuff. And you can get into his politics and whatnot, but I'm just here to talk about his, his automotive uh, accomplishments and what he did for uh, something that we all know and love. Anyway, that's all the bear has for you today. You all take care. Stay, uh, stay safe this July 4th, but have a great time, will you? Anyway, that's all I got. Take care, and as always, shine on.